Hey everyone, John Reed here from Learn to Stargaze and author of the Things to See with a Telescope series, including the new book, 110 Things to See with a Telescope, a book that takes the famous 200-year-old Messier list and organizes it by season with a custom star map for every object. In this video, I'm going to talk about how to set up a Celestron Advanced VX mount and a Celestron C8 telescope for visual observation. This is Learn to Stargaze. My journey into visual astronomy started about 12 years ago with the purchase of a very small telescope at a pharmacy for about $14. This telescope gave me my first wow moment when I used it to see Saturn rise above the BART line just outside San Francisco. This led me to purchase the Mead ETX-60, a backpack computerized go-to telescope where I saw my first deep sky object. And as beginner astronomers quickly realize, the more aperture you have, the more you can see. And so I soon upgraded to a 12-inch Dobsonian, which I took literally everywhere with me, on the roof of my wife's old BMW or in the back of my Chevy Volt. But as my friend Haley recently pointed out, there's a bit of a bell curve to telescope ownership. Hey, Haley. Hey. She's behind the camera. Here's how it works. At the beginning of one's astronomy journey, astronomers start small, like I did. They're on a budget. They don't know if they're willing to spend the big bucks. And they get a telescope that's probably no more powerful than my grandfather's binoculars. Then they see the Orion Nebula, or M13. Then they move on to larger and larger telescopes until you get older. Maybe you have a few more kids. There's not as much room in the car, and your kids can't even reach the eyepiece. And then you end up going down the curve, getting smaller and smaller telescopes. My two favorite telescopes are this C90 and this Sharp Star 61. But now back to this C8, which lies about here on my astronomer's telescope life cycle curve. Let's talk about this mount for a bit. I purchased this mount back in 2016 for 589 US dollars used on B&H Photo. Though I originally purchased this AVX mount to do astrophotography, I later upgraded it to the EQ6R Pro once I started taking that hobby more seriously. Note that I said that hobby. That's because astrophotography and stargazing are actually very different hobbies, despite the fact that people love trying to take images of what they see through their telescopes. So I want to reinforce, this video is about visual astronomy only. Now the Celestron Advanced VX, or AVX, was my first serious go-to mount, and it soon became my primary setup for visual observation. And although I missed the light gathering and resolution of the Big Dobsonian, there is definitely something to be said for a telescope that takes you directly to your target. Also, because I do a lot of outreach, and now that I have kids, three kids to be exact, I appreciate a telescope that stays where you put it when a five-year-old tries to hang off the eyepiece. Now the advantage of this particular mount for visual observing over and above the altazimuth mount such as the next star is the versatility. This mount takes virtually any style of telescope. For example, a long focal length telescope like this Explore Scientific 100mm refractor would run into the base of an altazimuth next star mount. It's also said that the tracking and go-to accuracy is much better on EQ mounts like this. This is because the mount only has to rotate on the right ascension axis while tracking, and this occurs at a constant rate of rotation. An altazimuth mount, like the next star, has to constantly adjust both axes using a computer algorithm. Of course, the other advantage is that if you want to switch to astrophotography, which again is a completely different hobby, then you can use this mount as well. Keep in mind the C8 telescope is not a great choice for a first astrophotography telescope because of its long focal length, which is very unforgiving. Let's take a quick look at this mount's stats. Well, just look at the website. There are a lot of them, but only a few that actually matter. Basically, you don't want to put a telescope much larger than this on this mount. If you do, you'll have trouble tracking, and you might even damage the mount over time. Now, this mount accepts Vixen-style dovetail adapters and this is pretty much standard across all telescope brands. For powering the mount, I just use a small Celestron power tank. Now this is actually an older version of this mount, so there is no USB port. Newer versions have a USB port in the hand controller, and this is for controlling the scope with a computer. To do that with this mount, you need a serial cable. You can also do firmware updates through the hand controller as well, but that's not something I've had to do. The mount also has auxiliary ports and an auto-guiding port, 
but again, these would be more for astrophotography, so I won't go into them here. Now on to the telescope itself, the Celestron C8. Now I purchased this telescope on eBay last year for $335 plus shipping and import fees to Canada. The C8 telescope is a classic, and this particular telescope is about 20 years old, and it probably came off an early generation next star mount. The C8 is extremely versatile. It's great for the moon and planets and even deep sky objects like galaxies and nebula. And this goes for the other Celestron SCTs as well, like the C6 and the C9.25. These scopes are a schmidt cassegrain design. The beauty of this design is that it's the equivalent of a Newtonian or refractor that's four or five times as long. They've smushed the optical train into this relatively tiny package by using a combination of two mirrors and a glass corrector plate at the front. The C8, as the name suggests, has eight inches of aperture and a focal length of 2,032 millimeters, giving a focal ratio of about f10. Newer versions of this telescope have slight differences, one being fast star capability. All that means is that the secondary mirror can be replaced with a hyperstar and camera. But again, astrophotography is outside the scope of this video. This long focal ratio is what makes this telescope great for close-up views of the moon and planets. It's not so good at large open star clusters like the Pleiades because it simply provides too much magnification. Now, one option that a lot of people do if they have this scope is to purchase a focal reducer for about $200. Now, a focal reducer is like a reverse Barlow. It reduces the magnification for a given eyepiece. It also widens the field of view, which is really nice as well. In terms of optional accessories, I love using these bullseye finders. These make finding targets in space extremely easy, especially if you're using star maps like those in 110 things to see with a telescope. Basically, you use the bullseye to make the sky look just like the picture of the map in the book. Now the first thing you always do when working with a telescope is to align the finder to the telescope. This is best done during the day. Basically what you do is you point the telescope at a distant object like a chimney, and then you go back and forth between the finder and the eyepiece, adjusting the finder here to move it left and right, and here to move it up and down until the chimney in the eyepiece and the finder is located in precisely the same spot. Now it's night and it's time to align the telescope to the night sky. But before we even turn on the telescope, you must do a rough polar alignment. This doesn't have to be a precise polar alignment, we'll get to that later. But you at least have to do the following. Level the mount as best you can. Now this can be challenging with the AVX because it doesn't have a built-in level like most mounts. I usually just use the level app on my phone and place the phone in the accessory tray. Next, we just wanna make sure that the mount is in the home position. You can verify this by looking at the index marks here and here and confirm that they line up. If they're not, you can loosen the mount like this and turn the mount until they do. Next, you're going to adjust the altitude knobs until this dial matches your latitude. Now we need to make sure that the telescope is pointed north. I use the compass app on my phone. I put the compass beside the telescope and move the entire mount until the telescope is pointed north. You can also tell if the telescope is roughly polar aligned by seeing if the north star is centered in your finder scope. So you've turned on your telescope. The first thing you need to do is set your location in the hand controller. You're gonna hit enter to confirm that the telescope is in the home position, but then you're gonna hit back and enter your latitude and longitude. You can also enter your city as well if you like scrolling through a giant list of cities. Now there are five different ways you can align this mount to the night sky, and these each give you slightly different levels of accuracy, and most people simply choose the one that suits their needs. These are as follows. The two star align. We'll cover this method in detail. Basically, you center the telescope on two bright stars that the telescope chooses for you. I also recommend adding calibration stars for added accuracy. This two star align method is the most accurate method. Then there's the one star align, similar to the two star align, but for those in a hurry. We have the solar system align. This is for when it's just beginning to get dark and you can't see the stars, but you can see the moon or bright planets. This is generally used when observing planets early in the evening. Then we have the quick align. 
This is when you just put in the location, time, and date. This is the least accurate, but it's fine if you plan on using the finder to find your targets anyway. And finally, we have last alignment. This is used if you haven't moved the telescope since you last used it. Now we're gonna go through the two star alignment process. You wanna use the two star alignment process when you want to see a lot of deep sky objects and require this mount's very accurate go-to capabilities. <laughs> All right, we've turned on the telescope and set the mount to the index marks. I'm gonna verify my location right here. And now it's time to set the time. I'm gonna pretend it's 11 o'clock at night. So I'm gonna put in 11 o'clock and hit enter. I'm gonna switch it from AM to PM. And now I'm going to choose standard time, not daylight savings. Daylight savings is reserved for those times between mid-March and mid-November. Next, I'm gonna select my time zone. I'll put some popular time zones here up on the screen. And for everyone else, here's the time zone map from the mounts manual. I'm in Halifax, so I'm gonna select time zone negative four. Now I'm gonna put in the date. This is November 30th, 2021. And I'm gonna select two star align. Now the telescope is going to select a star. If you don't know the brightest stars by heart, just trust the scope. The star it chooses will be the brightest one in the part of the sky that the telescope slews to. If you want to select the next brightest star, hit the back button. If you want to choose your own star, scroll up and down through a list of bright stars. You scroll up by hitting the six key, and you scroll down by hitting the nine key. Hit enter and the telescope will slew over to that star. Okay, so the telescope has stopped slewing and it's close to a bright star. Now I'm gonna use the hand controller to center the finder scope on that star. With the star centered in the finder, I hit enter. You'll notice that the telescope's slew speed has decreased. That's because it's time to center the star in the eyepiece. Once you center that bright star in the eyepiece, you hit a line. One important note about slewing with the hand controller, you always want to end your slew with the up and right buttons. This prevents backlash in the gears, whatever that is. If someone actually knows what backlash is, describe it in the comments. Now the telescope will select star number two. Again, you can override this with the back button or choose a star by scrolling up or down. With your star chosen, you're gonna hit enter. The telescope will slew to that star and again, you're gonna center that star in the finder scope, hit enter, and then you're gonna center the star in the eyepiece and hit a line. And you'd think you might be done, but you're not. You could stop here by hitting the back button, but it's a good idea to add more stars to the computer's algorithm. It's gonna ask you, would you like to add a calibration star? And now it's gonna choose another bright star, but one on the opposite side of the sky from the other stars that you've chosen. All right, now the telescope is over, pointed nearby our calibration star, and you're gonna follow the same process as we did for the other two stars. Adding calibration stars serves two purposes. First, it improves the pointing accuracy of the telescope, and second, if the telescope gets sloppy in its go-to, you can replace the calibration stars with other stars later by hitting a line on whatever target you're currently observing. Cool, huh? Now is it time to observe your first target? Well, you could, but if we really want good tracking, there's one more step. Now, if you want the go-to and tracking to work really, really, really well, you want to do an accurate polar alignment. And there is a quick and easy way to do this using the mount's internal computer. With the telescope pointed at a bright star about halfway up the sky, you're going to hit a line, then scroll down to polar align, hit enter, then scroll down to a line mount and hit enter. Now the telescope is going to give a scrolling message that tells you how to identify what is a good star. If you wanna choose a new star based on this warning, hit back. If you're happy with the current star, hit enter. The telescope will slew away from and back to your star. Now you'll need to use your directional pad to center it again. Hit enter once you've recentered the star. Now we'll ask you if you want to continue polar alignment. Hit enter to continue. The mount will move the telescope again. Now here's the most important part. Put the hand controller away. And now we're gonna use the altitude knobs and the azimuth knobs to center the telescope in the eyepiece. So you adjust the altitude by loosening one side and tightening the other. And you adjust the azimuth by loosening 
one knob and tightening the other. You do this until the star is centered in the eyepiece. When the star is centered in the eyepiece, hit enter and your telescope will now be very accurately polar aligned. And now it's time to observe our first target. But what should we choose? This is where a guidebook, like 110 Things to See with a Telescope, really comes in handy. This book organizes the famous Messier objects by season, so there's always something cool to see. And if you see all 110 targets, the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada will send you a certificate. There's even a special certificate program for those using a go-to mount like the Celestron AVX. Details in the back of the book. So let's say we want to go to the Orion Nebula, which is otherwise known as M42. We simply hit Deep Sky and scroll down to where it says Messier, hit Enter, and then we use the keypad to type in 42, and then hit Enter. The telescope will then slew to the target, and if you followed all the above steps, the Orion Nebula should be centered precisely in the eyepiece. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video on the Celestron Advanced VX Mount paired with a Celestron C8 telescope for visual observation. If you have any of my books, please let me know in the comments. I love to hear from my readers. And please subscribe so you don't miss the next video. And remember, the future is looking up.